Hello everyone, thank you for joining me. Today we are, are resuming chapter three of The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. This is lecture number 10, and we are just going to jump right into the book. My favorite author is my brother D.B., and my next favorite is Ring Lardner. My brother gave me a book by Ring Lardner for my birthday. Just before I went to Penn State, it had these very funny, crazy plays in it, and then it had this one story about a traffic cop that falls in love with this very cute girl that's always speeding. Only, he's married, the cop, so he can't marry her or anything. Then this girl gets killed because she's always speeding. That story just about killed me. So it's pretty obvious that Holden's very proud of his brother because he mentions that he is his favorite author. And I also think he looks up to his brother, he respects his opinion. He may find his brother to be really cool and admirable even though he now works in Hollywood, which he denigrated in a way and said that DB was prostituting himself out. I still think he looks up to his brother, loves his brother. And it's this, his second favorite author is Ring Lardner, right? Which is the gift his brother gave him for his birthday. And this happens when you have an older brother or an older cousin who you look up to and you think they're cool, right? They have good taste in music or books, movies, and they recommend something to you, you instantly come at it with expectations that this is going to be amazing. And because you have those expectations, it kind of shapes it for you, especially if you respect what this person thinks about it. Perhaps Holden isn't on the level of DB in regards to writing or understanding books or whatever it may be, but he's going to he understands that and will just automatically respect the taste and think that what book he's giving him is going to be a good book. This author must be good because his brother is selecting it for him. He wouldn't pick a bad author. It's the same if, you have, or if you're into music and there's a cool cousin or a cool older sister or a brother or whatever it may be and they show you a song they like and an artist they like, you don't you automatically like that, correct? Because you're like, their taste is good, so this must be good. Maybe I don't understand it. But I like it but no matter what you always come at it with like oh I like it because you're not certain about your own opinions really I think that's the case especially when you're younger you rely on people you respect people you find cool to kind of guide you into knowing good taste in various cultural activities also this ring Lardner is a real guy by the way if you're just curious it's not made up and the thing, the story he brings up, I want to talk about for a little bit, the cop who falls in love with a woman who we can say lives life dangerously. She's speeding, she's always in a rush, right? And that could be a problem as well in mentioning that she dies because it's this life where you're just constantly rushing from place to place, speeding. And I think it's also a symbol for living life in a fast manner, living life rather dangerously. And you always hear this sort of style of living, living to live fast, to die young, which happens here. And there's a trade-off of that life, and that life is often very romanticized by many of us, but culture as a whole, we look at those figures and we know many of them who are have this artist lifestyle or this free lifestyle where we almost envy it, it seems, because it it shows freedom and they're not stuck in convention, but that lifestyle kills them. They really do live fast and die young, whether it be from like this, driving and killing themselves, or a lot of the times it is drugs that do the men, they overdose. And the cop is, he's a traffic cop. One can assume that, you know, he follows the rules, right? He he is the one who is enforcing the rules. So of course he's going to abide by them, though cops do not. But he's going to abide by this. And there's almost this attraction to the, the woman who lives a, di a different life. She is breaking the rules and he's the one that's trying to stop her and make sure that she follows the rules. There's a dichotomy there, of course. And he's married already, but there's this life that attracts him and perhaps it's because there's a part of us when Typically when someone lives a rather sheltered life or is an individual who is frightened and apprehensive about breaking any rule, going, uh, doing something that's not conventional, 
that is not approved by society already and they meet someone who is unconventional, who does not follow the rules, who lives life to their own accord, there's a natural attraction to that person because this person's representing all everything in your unconscious, what you want to do, but you're too frightened to do. This is often portrayed in film, isn't it? Books as well, where there's a character who's attracted to this other individual who just lives this wild lifestyle, who's everything they're not. And they become like this fantasy that they want, but they know they can't have it, especially here because he's married. Furthermore, I think this story is indicating that typically we want something that we can't have. And there's this fantasy this man wants, which is to be with this woman and perhaps live a lifestyle that's similar to her. It's not speeding, but I think it's indicating something grander. And he wants this and this dream of his is killed correct it's the woman and that happens for many of us we have these dreams that we know we can't have or we won't we don't actually chase down and many times they end up dying the dream and in here in this case the girl also what I want to add about the cop and the woman is the person who lives freely and wildly like I mentioned they they can, that fast life typically destroys them. It's, it's not conducive for a long, stable life, which is what the traffic cop is probably going to have, a married, safe life. He's a traffic cop. He abides by the rules. He enforces the rules. He has a career that pays you modestly and you can live on. And it's that dichotomy of the two. And I mentioned this before, it's the kind of lives where one lives a life of quiet desperation often there's a longing that's unspoken when you want this wild and free life, but you can't ever get yourself out of your own comfort zone. And people end up usually having a midlife crisis, but it can be prolonged, but their life doesn't feel as fulfilled versus the individual who lives a dangerous life that's not conventional. And it may destroy them. And though they may not have the ability to have a normal, a quote unquote, normal life, family, everything of that nature, they live life one could say to the fullest, but they experience quite a bit in such a short period of time and therefore they actually lived and is this other person really living in the, just this monotonous, law-abiding, society, conduct-abiding, they do things that they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to live, how they're supposed to dress, this too much conformity and monotony where you become an automaton is that really living? And this story just about killed Holden, which is dark humor. And I know this is a phrase used to say you're really laughing, like, oh, we, ha ha ha, I'm dying. People say that a lot of the time. I used to say that, but I wanted to stop saying that. Or people just say dying and a bunch of emojis, right? When something's very funny. And here he said the story just about killed him. As in, it's funny. But what's different here is Holden's alluding to his own death and the reason this is important is because he drops these phrases and hints throughout the book and we have to pay attention to them because we already have the knowledge that Holden had a mental breakdown, that he suffered with depression. Therefore him joking about dying and his death is something that is hinting to where he is at in his mind state. Back to the book. What I like best is a book that's at least funny once in a while. I read a lot of classical books like The Return of the Native and all, and I like them. And I read a lot of war books and mysteries and all, but they don't knock me out too much. What really knocks me out is a book that when you're all done reading it, you wish the author that wrote it was a terrific friend of yours and you could call him up on the phone whenever you felt like it. I want to ask you, what books do you typically gravitate to? And this is something that most readers will say that they feel like when they read the novel, The Catcher in the Rye. It feels like we could call up Salinger and you know talk about anything because he seems so relatable. He made a hold in a relatable character, especially for any young males. And it just seems as if he understands us because he's speaking through Holden who is going through many of the same issues that we went through as teens and may still be going through now. Therefore, we feel like we could relate, he can understand, we could have a conversation that 
can get past the shallow surface and get into deeper conversations and also be it doesn't have to be so stern and serious it could be funny as well who are some of these authors for you i know some specifically for me are like kurt vonnegut you know, i love friedrich nietzsche and carl jung albert camus oscar wilde virginia wolf and edith wharton like these people that write books in a manner that it feels like you could really just call them up and have a conversation and you kind of you feel like oh man we could just be friends if they were still living almost every author I pick is unfortunately dead but what are some authors that do this for you and why why do you think so the books that compel us to want to call up the author like what Holden is saying here I think the reason it does that especially in fiction is because you know great fiction in a way it's not fiction and what I mean by that is it reproduces life and it does it in this it manages to do it great books do this to take everything we experience in life in the world and then it contracts it into a smaller more revealing form it, it, it pulls out patterns or things we're familiar with stuff that's actually true about the world and puts it in a form that's comprehensible and we can see it we can resonate with it we understand it we comprehend it with far greater accuracy and a great work of fiction provokes change in us and it not only makes us more aware of the world around us and other individuals, it makes us become far more aware of ourselves. It assists us. Great fiction reacquaints us with the world around us and with ourselves. It can comfort us in times of loneliness and despair, doesn't it? It can remind us that we're not alone in our problems, that we aren't crazy for viewing the world through a certain perspective. And that's always relieving, isn't it? It's like, if you are a bibliophile, you understand this feeling where, though when you read a book, you're in solitude, yet you don't feel lonely, you feel connected. It's one of the few times that you're really offered solace. You may lose yourself in the book, you may feel as if you're, you're inside the book, or you may just be so engulfed in the story that and the characters that you just kind of forget yourself and get into this flow state. And then when you reflect on it, it's as if, the author is speaking your thoughts and comprehending them and articulating them in a manner back to you to allow you to understand that the things you think, the things you feel, they may seem as if they are problems that you only deal with, thoughts that you only think, feelings that you only feel, but that's not true. It's common. We just don't express it in life to one another because of the, this idea what we see in catch, The Catching the Rye, where it's a world of appearances. We don't want to be open and vulnerable with one another. We don't want to let individuals really know what we're thinking, what we're feeling, because it may put us in a bad light. Especially when there are parts that are coming from our shadow, right? Things that will not make us look great to other people. Yet it's things that we all think, do, or feel. And I think when that when when we get to see uh, characters having these flaws or these thoughts or these feelings, we're able to work through our own because we can see it through another character. We're not stuck in our own subjective perspective. And when you get these variety of characters in a book, you often know people like these characters in your own life. And when they present them in a manner that shows you that these people are human, that they're lovable, and though they have flaws, they do have noble qualities as well. And their flaws can be explained once you learn about who they are, how they grew up, what bothers them. And you begin to have compassion for your fellow man, perhaps your family or just strangers you become far more patient and compassionate with them because you can understand them through the book. And this is one of the marvelous things about books in general, fiction, when it's not truly fiction. Great works of fiction do that. And when I'm done reading a good book, I don't know if you feel this way, but it feels as if it, it opened my senses and heightened them, it allowed me to, you know, quote unquote, see, feel it, I get out of the book, out of this 
world that the fiction world created, this author created in their book, and I go out into my own reality, and I have this newfound vigor for life. Even if the book is not particularly a happy one, I still feel better about my life. I don't feel as isolated and dejected, and I don't feel so disconnected from everyone else because I realize that human beings, we all struggle with many of the same things. Though the problems may be you know, different, the feelings that they evoke are the same. And we all pretty much want the same things. And meaning we want to find peace, we want to find joy, we want to find purpose and to have connection, to love and be loved. Like these things, the goals of how we want to get those are different, but those primary bases of what those feelings are, are all the same. And if you remember that, and you remember that everyone you meet has insecurities, they're self-conscious, they're anxious, they're fearful, you can be far more compassionate with them and understanding. It's always, it's a good reminder when you are interacting with people and it also eases to conversation because you're probably feeling nervous and anxious as well, but you tend to forget that this other individual is, is probably feeling in the exact same way. It was a shocker to me. I, mean, I don't know about you, but when I first discovered this thought about adults, when you're a kid, you don't really think about that, especially about your parents in particular, but any adults, you think like, oh, they all have to figure it out. You don't, you don't really imagine them having fears, anxieties, worries, being self-conscious until you get older. And then it allows you to feel far more compassion for your parents and for other adults and people in general, because you realize like, oh yeah, these, these people are not, they're still suffering through, from the same, a lot of the same emotional issues that you have as children. Of course, they, it's different, but not different meaning you're still worrying about what other people think, unfortunately. You still wanna make a good impression. You still want attention, love, and care. You can't help but feel anxious at times and self-conscious at times. But yeah, think about what books really allow you to, to, to feel as if you learned vastly more about yourself and others and the world. Back to the book. That doesn't happen much though. I wouldn't mind calling this Isaac Dennison up and Ring Lardner, except that DB told me he's dead. You take that book of Human Bondage by Somerset Maugham, though. I read it last summer. It's a pretty good book and all, but I wouldn't want to call Somerset Maugham up. I don't know. He just isn't the kind of guy I'd want to call up, that's all. I'd rather call old Thomas Hardy up. I like that you, you Stacy of I. So we get an inside look on the type of authors that Holden does like and would consider a friend, and we can look into that and start asking ourselves why in these particular ones. Ring Lardner seems to be a guy who's witty and has a sense of humor. It's Isaac Dennison, individual, I believe it's a woman, writing under a pen name. She wrote a memoir that we talked about out of Africa, and perhaps she seems like she's someone who understands what Holden's going through about this this idea of wanting things to be pure and innocent and not wanting the world to taint it. I don't know too much about the human bondage, perhaps you read it. Then Thomas Hardy, I, I don't, I haven't read his book, unfortunately. Of human bondage is a coming of age tale. I can't comment much into it, but it is considered a masterpiece and was made into a film. It's interesting that Holden's not into the book. He thought it was good, but he, he wouldn't call him up, though it's a coming of age tale, so you would think it would match where he's at in life, but if you have read it, perhaps you have more understanding. Are there books that you have read that, though you find them to be good, perhaps satisfying to read, you wouldn't want to call up the author, similar to what Holden is expressing here? I know I have. There's many. It's vastly more common for me to, to read a book. And I can say this was pretty good, but it doesn't leave me thinking like, oh, I would love to have a conversation with this author or 
I want to read the book again, or I'm thinking about it throughout my day and pondering about it and ruminating and thinking that this is just amazing. I have had that sometimes. I don't know about you, but like when you're reading a book that's really good, you have to like stop and be like, I love this book. I, and you almost don't want it to end. It might be the same thing as when you're watching a good TV series or a movie or like a good song, right? You want to keep replaying the song, you don't want it to end. And you can't help but being like, this song's so good or this book is so good. Lastly, I want to mention one last thing about this passage, which is when Holden says that Ring Lardner is dead. Because there are certain themes and motifs that you have already seen and maybe perceived, which are money and class. We have a lot of references to death. We have childhood and adulthood, and then the truth and phoniness. Let's just pay attention to that because it's brought up constantly. Each chapter references either all of these or just at least one of them. Back to the book. Anyway, I put on my new hat and sat down and started reading that book, Out of Africa. I'd read it already, but I wanted to read certain parts over again. One of the things about books is, though they, they change with you, right, when you read them later on, maybe after a few years and you've changed, the book may change, but you can pick them up and reread them at any time and the plot, the characters, the words, the setting, they're the same as, meaning they're suspended in time, they're the same names, they're the same setting. The plot's going to be the same. You may pick up new things about them, but everything's just suspended in time. It's, it's written, it's concrete. The words aren't going to change when you, with, in your book all of a sudden. And I think that might be something that draws hold into them because time stops there with these books. They don't have, and time isn't going to taint this, at least for him, like at life, correct? If, if he's finding a book to be a masterpiece, it won't become tainted later on. If you understand what I'm saying. Additionally with the books, there may, you may do this as well. What Holden mentions is that you read certain parts over again. You may skip to a part you really like, and you can jump back and forth whenever you want. Or if I read a passage or a sentence that's written in such beautiful prose, or that it says something so deep and impactful, I have to reread it multiple times, and each time it's just hitting me to really truly have the words just seep into my psyche and like my soul, so I'm trying to keep it and remember it and allow it to fully penetrate versus just glazing over and think, wow, that was really beautifully written. Because you can only imagine the writer, if you do write, when you get just this amazing sentence, perhaps you're constructing it, or may, it may just come as just this burst of inspiration that occurs sometimes and you write it down and you almost stay back, stand back and you can't imagine that you even wrote that and it may be something profound or just something just poetic and beautiful and touching and really articulate something perfectly or it's an ideal maxim that is something worthy of like a Nietzsche, correct, philosophizing with a hammer that is very impactful. When you read a maxim or an epigram that is very profound, it truly does hit you like a hammer, you instantly get like shot back and you have to think and it may make you ponder or laugh or think actually, wow, that is very true. I never thought about that. And when you do read something very beautifully written and poetic, it brings you into that kind of mood, that sentimentality and it's inspiring and touching and for me, it reminds me of what human beings are capable of and the feelings that we feel when they are expressed so beautifully and there's words to it and beautiful imagery. It's painting like this, this visual image that is stunning and sublime that allows you to truly experience what it is because perhaps you can't get, you can't find words for what you are feeling and then a brilliant author writes it and puts words to it, paints an image that just 
describes it perfectly and you resonate with it and you can't help wanting to reread it and reread it and reread it and say, yes, 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 that is what it is. I'm sure you can probably think of many examples from various books that you love. The interesting thing about books is that they don't change, but they do change, meaning it's the same book, but for some reason it doesn't appear the same way. You don't interpret it the same way. Each time you reread it, it's new. And if you're, you are a movie lover, fan of the cinema, I'm sure the same thing occurs with you when you, you rewatch a film that you love. And each time you see it, it changes for you and you may figure something out about the plot, the characters, something else may jump out at you. You may interpret something completely different. But back to the book. I'd only read about three pages though when I heard somebody coming through the shower curtains. Even without looking up, I knew right away who it was. It was Robert Ackley, this guy that roomed right next to me. There's a shower right between every two rooms in our wing, and about 85 times a day, old Ackley barged in on me. He was probably the only guy in the whole dorm besides me that wasn't down at the game. He hardly ever went anywhere. An exaggeration by Holden saying that he came in 85 times a day. I don't think it's that many. It's interesting that Ackley and Holden may be the only two guys not at the game, and why do you think that is? And as we will see shortly, and later on, but Holden criticizes Ackley harshly quite a bit, and he tries to make it seem as if he cannot stand him, that he's just this rotten guy. But his, his feelings become very ambivalent, and I think they become ambivalent to him, though he's trying to convince us that he just can't stand Ackley, that he's just the worst guy ever. But we will see as this chapter and the rest of the book pro progresses, you may start questioning whether or not he actually dislikes him as much as he tells us. I also think that not only is he more fond of Ackley than he wants to admit, but I, it also seems as if he has more, much more in common with Ackley than a lot of the other boys at Pincy Prep. Another thing that he may vehemently oppose and reject because to admit that is just to his own dismay in his mind. It's shocking, it's horrifying. He wants to be nothing like Ackley. And perhaps the reason, so the reason is it'll be apparent as he continues to describe him, but one of the things that we can already assume is that Ackley must be unpopular. Ackley isn't, we can presume that Ackley isn't a sociable kid, nor is he well liked because he is not at the big game. And if this is a big game in which the whole school attends, then one could presume that if someone had friends, they would be a part of the school spirit and they would be at the game, but Ackley is not. Ackley is constantly bugging Holden, so therefore he must like Holden. And I think that Holden must like Ackley, or at least like him a little bit, or enough to where he puts up with them. If he's coming in 85 times a day, or even half of that time, half of that, he's coming in 20, 40 times a day, and he doesn't just kick him out or lose his temper with them, then he must not hate him as much as he wants to tell us. So let's get back to the book. He was a very peculiar guy. He was a senior and he'd been at Pincy the whole four years and all, but nobody ever called him anything except Ackley. Not even Herb Gale, his own roommate, ever called him Bob or even Ack. If he ever gets married, his own wife will probably call him Ackley. Another indication that Ackley is very unpopular because he's a senior in high school and he's been there all four years and he doesn't have any friends. Holden seems like the only guy he wants to hang out with and Holden doesn't even consider him a friend. And as we will see, Ackley doesn't really seem like he considers Holden a friend either. And the reason this is remarkable is if you look back, if you're in high school now, then you know this, but if you're not, you can look back in your high school career and those memories, the individuals who were considered unpopular, whether they be like the nerd kids or you know, the, the quote unquote freaks or the antisocial kids, whoever it may be, whoever was considered unpopular, they had friends, right? They still had their own little group or little clique, especially if they were there four years. It would have been different if he was a senior and he transferred there that year. Then you could say, okay, maybe he just hasn't made friends. That's all right, but he's been there all four years and hasn't. he doesn't have a friend group. 
or even at least one best friend. The only friend that seems like he has is Holden, but it's not really his friend. And that's quite sad, and that gives us an indication of the kind of character Ackley is. And it's also sad that nobody's given him a nickname. And I think that's another indication he's not a well-received person. Because Holden's even exaggerating to the point that he would he boldly asserts that his wife would not even give him a pet name. Which is crazy. But he's trying to really give us an idea and a picture of who Ackley is and the character he is and the way he is perceived by the rest of the school. Which is obviously not good. And regarding in regards to nicknames, think about your own friend group. I'm sure you have, perhaps you have a nickname, perhaps you give nicknames. There is probably at least, I'm certain there's one person in your friend group that has a nickname that doesn't go by their real name that you all call them, correct? And it's quite nice. I think it's always, it's, it's nice when someone does give you a nickname because it puts you usually on friendly terms. I really like when someone gives you, because nicknames you don't give yourself. If you do, it's odd. But typically a friend will give you a nickname and everyone else will start calling you that. And it's like this bond that, that you guys have because of it. And it puts you on friendly terms. I know I, I always find, I fancy it when a teacher in particular, or just anybody in general, but I remember even teachers would, when they would call me Frankie without me telling them to call me Frankie. It was this, it, it's almost sweet. And it's like, okay, this person, it's hard to describe, but it puts you, it makes it seem as this individual has a fondness for you, right? And same with my friends, if they would say, you know, Frankie, Frankie Boy, Frank Ford. It doesn't even have to be a big nickname, but just a little variation on my name. And it coming from them with like a nice smile and friendly, then you think, okay, then we're on good enough terms where this individual feels comfortable enough to change up my name, even slightly, and not be nervous or apprehensive. And it also is a little more special for many individuals when they have a friend or like he mentions a wife where they have a special name for each other or only my friends call me this or only my family calls me this there's almost this bond right or like my girlfriend only calls me this boyfriend calls me this name and just because they call you some some other name it it makes your bond tighter right and i wonder if you're the friend that gives nicknames or if you have one and I just want to touch upon the topic of friends because I think there's it's an odd thing about friendship and that there's not really a clear pattern because it changes and what I mean is think about your best friends we we'll talk about them in particular can you point to a certain time in your life with them in which there was a clear line of demarcation of when an event occurred that shifted you from just being like kind of friends to being best friends I always find that interesting and sometimes there is those nights or days or whatever it may be perhaps you guys went out together just you and that you and him or you and her and you had a great time together and this allowed you guys to bond perhaps there's a time when just you two hung out and you you both had an in-depth and deep conversation about each other's lives your fears your hopes your, your dreams your background of your life in a, in a way that you're vulnerable and open and both of you were and you felt like I really like that person and I felt like I could trust them and that could have shifted you into becoming best friends because now you feel comfortable. Uh, ask yourself the best friends that you did have or currently have, how did you become best friends? When did you know, is what I'm saying, when did you know that you two both agreed like, oh yeah, we're best friends now? Was there a time, was it, was it like stepbrothers? after they did karate in the garage with the pumpkins and said they're best friends. I think that, I haven't seen that film since high school, but I'm, I'm assuming that was, that's right. And then there's the other odd friendship in which it just occurs over time. The, the growth is so imperceptible that you do not even notice it. It's just one day when you just, it's just, it's so, it's most natural, right? And if you were to ask either of you and and the question I just asked and said, when did, how did you guys become best friends? When did you know you, you two were best friends? Was there an event? And you may just think, mm, it just kind of happened. 
because each time you just kind of grow closer and closer and perhaps you do you take a step in the right direction towards friendship because there's like stages of friendship isn't there you have like acquaintances and they move into this bunch of different variations of friends that you have and then there's it takes something either special to make you into best friends or just this over grad this long gradual period of time when you just see each other enough that all of a sudden you just feel comfortable around that person and you don't even realize like there was a huge change until after you reflect and you're like oh i'm actually kind of best friends with this person i don't know how but it just happened and lastly i want to talk about one last thing about friendship which i find to be kind of i find sorrowful in a way i don't want to get melancholy but it's interesting that an individual can be a complete stranger and then they enter your life and you guys can be friends you can be best friends and you can share this this chapter in your life together, right? You, your world combines with their world. And in this period of time, you guys are sharing worlds, sharing each other's lives together. They become like a brother or a sister to you. Someone you can trust and rely upon and who makes this world much better and pleasurable, right? It makes life amazing when you have best friends that you really love and care about and vice versa. Like they love and care about you, it's, it's nice. But what I find to be odd is you can be complete strangers, then you can be best friends, and then you can fall back and be complete strangers once again very quickly and never speak to that person again. And I find that to be quite sad, and it, it occurs frequently, doesn't it? And it's, it's also awkward when you want to meet that friend again because you guys have changed so much over time, and it's never the same, right? Because you, you both changed, which is good. You should change. And all you can really do is just look back on those memories and just be appreciative that that person was in your life for that, that period of time and that chapter of your life, they made that, that chapter special and they provided you with many memories. And that's, that's wonderful in itself, but yeah, enough about the idea of friendship. Let's get back to the book. He was one of these very, very tall, round-shouldered guys. He was about 6'4", with lousy teeth. The whole time he roomed next to me, I never even once saw him brush his teeth. They always looked mossy and awful, and he damn near made you sick if you saw him in the dining room with his mouth full of mashed potatoes and peas or something. Besides that, he had a lot of pimples, not just on his forehead or his chin, like most guys, but all over his face. And not only that, he had a terrible personality. He was also sort of a nasty guy. I wasn't too crazy about him, to tell you the truth. So Agley is repulsive, physically and personality-wise. There's nothing that seems like Holden is not saying there's any redeeming qualities about him, and that can explain why he has no friends. Because he, he may not even have, he may not have nothing that, that adds value to him to other people. They may see him and perceive him, and they can't. They may have the same ideas and judgments and opinions that Holden has about Ackley, and that he's not physically appealing, and then when you talk to him, he's... He has no redeeming personality traits that you find charming. He has no charm. Maybe he's intelligent, we don't know. Maybe, maybe he's an athletic individual, probably not. And therefore, he's going to find, he's going to have difficulty making friends. And so, like I said, it's no wonder people may hate and disdain this guy and why he has no one that's giving them nicknames. Holden says he's not too crazy about him, but I think this just tends to happen when someone's around you all the time. You may, they may drive you crazy and drive you nuts. This happens typically with coworkers, perhaps schoolmates as well, or teammates. And you may have like a disdain for them and find them absolutely repugnant, but if something were to happen to them, you would feel sad. You can't help but kind of care about a person that's constantly around. And the funny thing too is if they didn't show up or they didn't bug you like they always do, you kind of feel like something's missing in that day. You're like, Where? wait, what's happening? Why isn't this person bugging me? And you kind of want them to come. It's weird. I'm, I wonder if you have any examples like that in your life. And there's also a kid that I knew in my school who reminded me of Ackley in regards to him being someone who nobody liked. He was like Ackley in regards to being physically unappealing. He had no redeeming qualities. He wasn't very intelligent, he wasn't athletic, and his personality was, was terrible, it's rotten. He had no charm, he was 
he was bad. I remember trying to, me and my friends would do this in regards to, we both, all of us tried this, it was like three of us, where individuals would say terrible things about this kid. And we would say, he can't be that bad because I was optimistic, I was friendly, I was kind. I'm saying all these great things about myself then. But I, I just wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt and you can't help but feel pity about these people. I don't know if you have them in your, in your life or at school at certain times where everyone just is mean to this person. Even teachers don't even like this kid. And you say, oh, I kind of feel bad for this kid. He can't be that bad. And you try to talk to him and he is just, you can't, you can't stand him after about an hour. You're like, no wonder everyone's mean to you because they have this rotten personality. But in a way, like now that I got older, I realized perhaps the reason they have this rotten personality is because they have insecurities. They're so used to people treating them in a terrible manner or they're expecting people to treat them in a negative manner that they're instantly already throwing that negativity at you, right? And that tends to happen to people. If you think the world is a terrible place, it's going to reflect itself as a terrible place. If you're constantly thinking that everyone is untrustworthy or evil or malicious, you're going to have that perception and expectation. So in your mind, you're already hostile if you think everyone's going to be hostile to, towards you, right? So you're gonna send that out and the person's going to be caught off guard and they're going to do what you expect them to do, which is to be hostile. And if you're coming at them with like friendly openness, typically individuals will be positive and friendly to you. It's rare, very, very rare if you are meeting somebody or engaging in an interaction with someone and you're being positive, friendly, kind, it's, it takes a rare individual to actually be spiteful, malicious, and mean to you. At first they may be, but then if, you, if it's long enough, they can't help but kind of put that guard down and be a little more open and kind to you. I'm, I'm sure there's examples like that in your life where someone was very, you know, arms crossed, refusing to let anyone penetrate their icy exterior icy exterior and they were hearted and coarse but you just kept smiling at them and being kind and polite and asking about them and eventually they're kind and they smile you get them to laugh you get them to open up you get them to finally release their arms and their defense lastly about this passage holden says i wasn't too crazy about him to tell you the truth and he's trying to convince us that he wasn't crazy about him and he is so vehemently opposed to Ackley with all his harsh criticism, his critiques. He has this like indignation for him, right? He wants to, to criticize him and has harsh judgments. And therefore he really wants to prove to everyone that he's not friends with this guy. He doesn't like this kid, but I think that's far from the truth. And I even think Holden knows that his feelings for him are ambivalent. And we will see this as the chapter progresses and as the book progresses. Therefore, I think here he's really trying to convince us and himself that he doesn't like him. And this may just stem from, maybe he does find him at times very unlikable, but I also think there's a part of him that is insecure. And as a kid, especially in like a high school, if there's a person that is not considered likable by anybody else, you almost don't want to be associated with them. You want to be apart with everyone else and be in that group of judgment. You want to say, oh yeah, I don't like them because you don't want to feel as if you're friends with them. I know that's wrong, but you do feel that way when you're in high school, right? If someone says, hey, aren't you friends with them? And you would say, no, I don't even like this kid. He's so annoying, he follows me around. He just barges in my room 85 times a day. What am I supposed to do? I can't kick him out, right? Something like that if Holden was to respond, if someone was to say that him and Holden Ackley were friends he would he would probably instantly react and be very defensive and I think here he's trying to convince us and himself like I mentioned that he doesn't like Ackley but I think it's ambivalent we will see as we continue but I am going to end this lecture here and we will pick it up on page 26 next time thank you for listening bye